Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Kennedy. I'm an associate professor at uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, I'm going to begin with a Monty Python quote. Um, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some topology optimization applications we've been working on and uh, the use of second derivatives in some of these applications that we've, we've um, been looking at. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about MDO, open MDAO. So uh, topology optimization is a technique for uh, finding novel designs, designs that don't have um, a lot in common with, uh, with, with previous designs, free from geometric restriction. These techniques have been applied in a number uh, of different areas, um, including uh, the optimization of an Airbus A380 uh, leading edge ribs. Uh, they have seen applications in civil engineering and a lot of applications in automotive engineering where uh, weight reduction can be uh, important. Um, and really the way a topology optimization uh, works, at least the, the technique that I'm going to be um, relying on um, in, in this work, is that um, we start off with a, a problem definition. And this problem definition consists of a domain where the, the, there may or may not be structure. So there's kind of a, an option to put, put the structure anywhere within this domain and it can take any shape. Uh, this problem definition also contains boundary conditions and loads that are applied to this hypothetical structure. And then in addition to those loads and boundary conditions, there's a, a optimization problem uh, definition. And, and often it's um, uh, minimizing uh, deflection subject to uh, a mass constraint. Uh, we then take this problem definition and we, we discretize it uh, using a finite element mesh. And to each element in the mesh, more or less, we uh, assign a, a variable. And that that's a variable is a continuous density variable between 0 and 1, 1 indicating a material is present, 0 indicating the absence or of a material. So uh, because the, the volume mesh can be very uh, large, these meshes can be very large, there tends to be a lot of design variables in these topology optimization problems. And then we, uh, dis we optimize on, on top of that uh, with, with the original problem definition, with the optimization statement to obtain um, an optimal structure, an optimized uh, structure. Um, so in, in this case on the, on the lower right, you can see um, two examples of uh, topology optimization with um, a large number of degrees of freedom. So um, what we're trying to do with topology optimization is uh, in the past these have been primary techniques have been primarily applied to um, linear problems um, with some some pretty uh, simple objectives. We're trying to improve optimization algorithms, uh, extend those simple linear models to include a geometric and material nonlinearity. Uh, a lot of the times we, uh, in topology optimization, we deal with a single structural discipline. We're trying to expand that to use uh, multi-physics problems, so coupling in thermal uh, problems, uh, magnetostatic problems, and other type, types of problems where there's, there's tight coupling between the physics. And then uh, also we're, we're looking at um, coupling with other disciplines, and I think the, distinguish between, the, the, um, the distinguishing feature that I make between multi-physics and coupled uh, uh, MDO in, in this context is that I think that the, the uh, MDO kind of is, is at some kind of domain boundary, so whereas the multi-physics kind of is within the same domain. So where does MDO and, and open MDAO come into this picture? Well, um, the way we're using open MDAO right now in the context of topology optimization is we're um, forming more complicated kind of system level uh, objectives from the, the structural analysis. So as an example, um, we did an optimization where we were looking at um, optimizing a structure for impact 
of the structure. So we had an additional kind of high level analysis where we examined what the impact loads would be. And then we had a topology optimization that we coupled to that, um, taking those impact loads from this, this high level analysis and feeding them into the topology optimization. We're also integrating um, with MFIS. Where, where we're going to um, use OpenMDAO in the future is to kind of improve modularity within our own set of, of tools, as well as, as coupling to other disciplines that uh, I think, think is important, and uh, obviously including, including derivatives. I'm going to present some, some topology optimization results over the next couple of slides, but I wanted to make a plug for our optimizer Paropt, uh, which is coupled to both um, uh, through Py PyOp Sparse. It's in PyOp Sparse as a, as a package there, but it also comes with an OpenMDAO driver. Uh, so there's two ways you can use Paropt within your optimization um, code once you've got it set up. Um, and the advantage that it has is that it's a scalable optimizer. So if your design vector is distributed, and in the case of these topology optimization problems with millions of design variables, it's important to distribute the optimization work as well. And so we can achieve scalability of the optimization algorithm as shown on the, the left there with the strong scaling of the optimization algorithm. Try, try, so my plug is to try it out. Try, try out bar out. Um, a lot of this talk is about second derivatives. So I'm going to talk about three different uses we've made of second derivatives. Um, in the, the first case, um, we've used um, Hessian vector products. I'm not going to talk a little a lot about this application, but uh, in this particular case, a, a Hessian uh, vector product, you can compute using a, a second order adjoint. So that's basically the second derivative version of the adjoint, sorry, Justin. Um, and uh, basically you have to solve a, a linear system uh, in this particular, for this particular objective, there's a simplification. Typically a second order adjoint will involve two solutions of a linear system, but this one simplifies. And then you can compute uh, a Hessian vector product from that, that adjoint solution. So this can be used then to accelerate your optimization algorithm and um, can lead to the case where your number of iterations in your optimization algorithms remains constant as the number of design variables increases in the problem. So shown in blue here on the bottom right is the uh, par opt convergence history versus the IP opt with the, with the second uh, order Hessian vector products versus IP opt in orange where it takes a long time to, to converge. Um, some compliance optimization problems, which is uh, an objective that maximizes the stiffness of a structure subject to a mass constraint. These, these problems are very common in topology optimization. And one of the things we've done with second derivatives in this application is we've used approximate second derivative information to improve the, uh, the, the speed of convergence of, of the optimization algorithm. I wanted to kind of demonstrate to you why this is the case. So on the, this is a very simple uh, problem, a stokes vanberg truss. Here, there's two design variables. There's a group of three red bars and a group of three blue bars that are grouped together and they all have the same cross-sectional area as the design variable. So you can plot this um, as a, a 2D contour plot, which is shown here on the right on the top row. Now in topology optimization, the way you get to this kind of uh, nice solution that you want to see whether there's a sharp definition of the boundaries is you have to imply some kind of penalization. You have to imply penalization that removes kind of intermediate material. And so when you apply the penalization, you go from the, the uh, left column of figures to the right column of figures. And uh, basically what happens is the, the space, the design space goes from being convex to being non-convex. And uh, as a result of that, uh, when you use a, uh, a Hessian, uh, a quasi-Newton Hessian approximation, there can be a lot of curvature failure, uh, curvature condition failures. 
So shown here on the, on the bottom left, uh, on the bottom row of figures, excuse me, is a uh, 1D slice of the design space along where a mass constraint is applied where there's uh, subsequent failures of the, the, the curvature condition. Uh, and that results in a loss of information. So uh, what we've done to uh, alleviate this problem is we've uh, identified that the Hessian in this case can be split between a positive part and a negative part. And that uh, negative part of the Hessian is, is really responsible for these, these curvature condition failures. So we can basically add back in this negative part and just basically approximate just P here. So uh, basically in our optimization algorithm, instead of trying to use the full Hessian, we're just using the positive part of the Hessian. To show how this can work in some optimization cases, we've got a series of different optimization problems we've used, uh, and, and this will work both for the, this compliance or maximizing stiffness as an objective, and uh, maximizing uh, or, or uh, minimizing mass with a frequency constraint and for a, a large number of problems. So here we're gonna solve, I'm gonna show results with uh, over 150 3D topology optimization problems. First up, over uh, a, set, a subset of these problems, um, we can show that the, this curvature condition that we were ha having a lot of problems with with some optimizers um, basically is eliminated. So we have here three different optimizers we're using, uh, IPopt, SNopt, and paropt without adding in that correction term that eliminates the negative part of that, that Hessian. And then uh, the paropt with that Hessian correction. So when we add that back in, basically all these curvature condition failures that we were seeing um, without that correction uh, go away. And then if we look at the optimization histories for all these different optimizers and average over these 150 problem cases, uh, the, the purple line is the paropt line with the correction applied and it, it beats everything else. Uh, beats IPopt, SNopt, and um, MMA, which is an optimizer that a lot of people in topology optimization really like. And then if we look at kind of a, a set number of uh, iterations, just limiting ourselves to 100 iterations and look at the performance profile at that, um, at that point, we see paropt with this correction beats everything else by a, by a long shot. Uh, this correction that we've developed can be used uh, for large scale cases. So these uh, four different cases here uh, each have about a, well, they each have more than 90 million degrees of freedom and about uh, 30 million plus uh, design variables in them. So my conclusion from this is that um, we, we spend a lot of time uh, worrying about derivative accuracy. Um, and for first derivatives, we have to be accurate because we use those to compute the KKT conditions to tell us whether we're at a minimizer. But for second derivative, uh, for second derivatives, we, we actually don't need um, accuracy all the time. In fact, what we did in this study was we made our second derivatives less accurate by adding in this correction term and our optimi optimizer performance got better. And so I think that's, a, that's an important perspective to have, um, that the second derivatives, are, it's not necessary that they always be, be accurate in the optimization context. It's maybe more important that the, um, you have these other properties that the, the curvature is, is positive, that the uh, Hessian approximation is positive definite. I wanna switch gears now um, and, and talk about a new coding effort 
that we've uh, been undertaking in our group. And um, in order to explain why we're doing this, I wanted to kind of uh, relay some lessons learned from some experience uh, coding tax. In particular, uh, in around uh, 2011, uh, I got really excited about threading and computing with threads. And we added in, or I added in, a, uh, some threaded capability into tax that uses p threads. Um, this was prior to a lot of development that's taken place in C++ subsequent to that time. Um, and while the threaded code was kind of fun to develop, actually, it is not portable and it's not really performant uh, today. So I think the, the lesson I, I learned from that experience is um, that uh, you need the right level of abstraction to, uh, to use so that you can later on kind of shift um, your, your code base to, to new techniques as, as new methods become available. Also part of this uh, issue with tax is that um, it's got a very uh, structured way of, of looking at the uh, memory it utilizes. And so part of, of threading and, and and uh, moving on to um, GPUs and GPU computing are different memory layouts. And unfortunately, the, the development we've done with TAX has been um, kind of fixed with a, 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 a very uh, rigid view of how the memory is available. And so getting on to a, a GPU with TAX is just not going to be possible. And part of the reason for this is we have this view of a vector and extracting elements from that vector, doing uh, some computations on those element um, values, producing an element residual, and then scattering those values back to a, a, global, a global vector. There's also a problem here in that when you distribute that global vector across uh, many processors, then you have to kind of fake that you actually have access to all those vector components even when you're they point to other processors. So a, a better view of um, how to manage a vector, I think, is through um, kind of this element level view of a vector where we kind of buffer um, the uh, element uh, specific degrees of freedom across many elements at the same time um, compute the, resi the residuals or compute, do the computations on all those elements individually uh, in an order that can be specified at a different time and then uh, scatter the, all, all the residuals simultaneously. So this is kind of a different perspective of how um, uh, tax would be structured. So as part of this new coding effort that we've um, been, been working on, there's kind of two levels of abstraction we're using. Um, we are looking at different views of a vector, um, trying to generalize basically how an element accesses uh, a vector. And then we're also trying to generalize on how um, the uh, residuals get, get uh, computed by um, defining a, an, an execution pattern that's, that's different. And then we're also looking at now using uh, automatic differentiation um, throughout the code so that we don't have to compute derivatives. So to, to encapsulate all these kind of strategies, we're um, looking at uh, developing this tool we're calling A2D, almost automatic differentiation. Uh, that, that will um, compute derivatives and, and use these uh, abstractions on, on memory views and uh, execution pattern. So this is gonna get us back to the multi-physics applications of topology optimization and uh, that, I, that I was talking about earlier. 
Um, so the uh, thing with this new code that we're developing is it's, it's still uh, in, it, in its infancy right now. We have some, some prototype code for it that's working, that's showing, demonstrating this topology optimization capability. And, and basically what will eventually happen with this is we'll bring it back under the hood of, of tax so that we can seamlessly integrate with all of the um, tools that we've developed specifically for MFIS and other OpenMDAO projects. So with, with A to D, we need uh, not only first derivatives, we need second derivatives as well. And, and the reason for this is in a structural problem uh, where uh, we solve for the equilibrium solution by minimizing the, the total potential energy. So in order to minimize the total potential energy, we take the derivative of the energy and, and set that equal to zero, and that becomes our residuals. Uh, instead of using automatic differentiation across the entire residual computation, we kind of divide it so that it's only taking the uh, derivative of a small piece of this residual computation, and then the rest is not automatically differentiated. It, we, we kind of have computed those derivatives uh, in, in a different way by hand. We then need to take the derivative of the um, uh, residuals to give us a Jacobian matrix and the derivative of the residuals using a mixed partial derivative to get us terms that we need for Hessian vector or uh, adjoint vector products needed for um, the, the computation of the, the total derivative or of the gradient. And so that's really why we need a different uh, AD tool is because of these, these uh, second derivatives. So uh, in, to get second derivatives uh, using automatic differentiation, um, we basically have to first apply regular reverse mode differentiation and then do two additional passes. So then we do a, an additional forward pa pass and an additional reverse pass to compute the um, Jacobian or the Hessian, excuse me, of the, um, of the original function. Uh, in, in, in the code, that, that looks something like this, as shown here on, on the right. Okay, so, so as an initial uh, demonstration of these uh, topology optimization capabilities with, with A to D, we did a geometrically nonlinear topology optimization. And so usually uh, with topology optimization, if you, uh, if you have a linear problem and you change the magnitude of the load that, but, but keep everything else uh, fixed for this type of problem, the design won't change. But because we have included geometric uh, nonlinearity, the uh, design changes as the magnitude of the load increases. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to uh, briefly touch on was um, a proposed, uh, so, so at the previous, at the last, uh, or at uh, the MDO workshop in 2019, I proposed um, uh, bring your own vector. And um, uh, I think that uh, the MDO, MDO uh, open MDO team tried uh, to, to implement various strategies to do that, um, but didn't come to a technique that kind of satisfied all the requirements. Um, I, I think that there may be a, an approach to do this um, that uh, could use the same kind of view of vectors that I kind of described earlier. I know that the, in the code, what kind of happens is there's a, a slicing operation that occurs for, for each component. Uh, so it can view, it's, it's part of the, um, the, the global kind of a vector. Um, the, the issue, the, the reason why this can be a problem is that, um, if the data is not stored on a CPU, if it's stored on, on GPU, 
then there can be a lot of latency in accessing those components that aren't on the CPU. Uh, and that can, can uh, outweigh any benefits of doing GPU, comp GPU computing. So what I would propose is that th there are kind of set of global vector operations that work on both ex the immediately accessible and inaccessible parts of the, the vector. This would be norm and dot product uh, kind of operations. But that component-wise uh, access to uh, the, the vectors be controlled through this kind of uh, view that buffers the, the, the data that uh, can either uh, do read-write operations on this set of, set of buffers in place of that. Uh, this would then maybe limit the capability to do automatic scaling, especially on components that were inaccessible. But uh, that might be fine. All right, so to uh, conclude, um, second derivatives can provide a, a good computational e efficiency, and I think um, I know that that's on the path of the OpenMDAO team, um, and a little bit. <laughs> um, automatic differentiation, uh, I think, is a, is a good tool, and that I think we should consider uh, Bring your own vector uh, to yeah, integrate OpenMDAO with uh, other uh, high performance computing um, codes. So, thank you. You know, you're in trouble when your former advisor has a question. Uh, it's really impressive work um, on all fronts there. Um, when you talk about that correction for the second order derivatives, I think of uh, quasi, -Newton, uh, quasi Newton methods and how they force the Hessian to be positive at all times, and that works. Um, is there a direct relation there? Yes. So, what we're doing is we're applying this um, correction to ensure that the quasi-Newton Hessian approximate only, only approximates P. It doesn't approximate the full Hessian, it just approximates this positive part. And the reason I think that works so well is because if you go back here, you kind of see this, this almost um, uh, negative curvature behavior yeah. of the compliance design space. I mean, basically, it's the same reason, uh, what I'm trying to get at the connection there, it's the same reason why it works well with quasi-Newton methods, or is there something different there? Well, I think, I think our method is um, m closer to what's happening with, it's like exploiting the problem structure. I see. So, so it's a better way of doing it than, than some of these like damped updates or other, other things where you're basically losing information here, at least, we're approximating a positive definite matrix that's only, that's not the true Hessian, but at least it's a consistent approximation. Right. My next question then is how, what's, what's the broadest possible application here? How generalizable is it? That's what we're still trying to figure out. Okay. So we're trying to figure out whether this, because there's, th there's lots of other problems that, that could, this could fit into, but I think that this kind of concept of uh, a, a uh, better Hessian approximation mm -hmm. is, is a good one. I think I, I want to try and figure out where else it can apply. Anyway, really impressive, the convergence of power up to the correction. Thanks. As a follow-up, could you just clarify the, this Hessian approximation only the positive part? You don't need a second, you don't need a Hessian for that. You're approximating the Hessian. Or you still require a, set, a Hessian from the underlying code. We, uh, so if you had taken my optimization course, you'd know <laughs> that uh, there was, uh, you know, when you use a quasi-Newton approximation, you have a gradient step and a, a design step. So we're modifying that. Right. Yeah. But keeping everything else in place. Um, two questions. So uh, on, that, on that same note, um, the, how do you, if you're just given a, 
you're, I, as I understand it, you're getting out a Hessian matrix from taking the second adjoint of the, the various different modules that you're doing. If you're Okay, so there's here. there's two yes. there's two Hessians here, right? So th are we talking about this one or the, the other yeah, one? Yeah, I'm talking about this one. This how one. do you split, how do you know what's the positive semi-definite part and what's the negative part? What method are you using to separate those two things? I did some analysis okay. by hand. <laughs> so it's problem specific, it's not. It is problem specific, yes. Okay. But I think that this kind of s splitting is, uh, may exist in other problems that we're, we're trying to work work with that, yeah. Okay, and then second, uh, you've got d squared f here um, instead of, so like a BFGS usually use the, the Hessian of the Lagrangian rather than the Hessian of the f? The, yes, so it, it, in this case, they're the same, but um, because the constraint is linear. Uh, but yes, in general, we approximate the second uh, derivative of the Hessian, okay. or the, yeah, the Lagrangian, excuse me. Um, follow on of your first answer, what kind of analysis <laughs> by hand? I, I took two derivatives by hand oh, to yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then do you recompute this approximate Hessian at each step? And if not, when do you know when to do it? Uh, recompute, re yeah, so we, we have to uh, compute this correction at every step. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's computationally efficient, though, because we did it for this, the, these problems. Hey, um, super, super cool presentation. Um, and I was very interested to see your stuff about the threading in tax, because I recently had some very weird tax behavior that turned out to be due to threading. Um, question, uh, paropt, I, I really like paropt, I found that for, uh, Certain problems, I get much better performance even than, than SNOPT, and people in the lab will tell you that I, I sing the praises of PARUP to, to other lab members. Um, but I found that it, like you say, it scales very well in terms of number of DVs, but not so well in terms of number of constraints. Um, is there any plan on your horizon to add sort of support for sparse constraints? Uh, I would love to add sparse constraints. Uh, we have not because in topology optimization they tend not to, yeah. to um, arise. And it has some capability to do some sparse constraints, but those have a very specific structure. Yeah. Um, I would love to. I, w I would love to do it though. Okay. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm really excited about paropt. I'm curious if you think that the method that you used here, like I'm presuming the performance of every, optimi other, every other optimizer was quasi-Newton, like when you were showing IPOPS uh, convergence history and everything else. You haven't tried to put this at, you know, no f feed second derivative information to IPOPT yet, have you? Okay. I, I, I think that's something we could do. Uh, sorry? We have a term term conflict here. The Hessian that IPOPT would want is the third derivative, I think. No. The, the derivative of your residual is the Jacobian, which is already a second. No, 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 no. That's, that, that's, 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 that's the second part. This is, we're talking about a different, that's the, that's the third, uh, that's the third second derivative I talked about. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. We should probably move on. Thank you very much. Thank you.